I'm David. I work upstairs um, on the Brain team doing machine learning stuff. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some work that I have done along with a number of other people um, in collaboration do on, um, broadly speaking, just machine learning on proteins um, and relating uh, protein sequences directly to their function. So um, before I go any further, I just want to tell you a little bit about me. Um, so I've been doing machine learning since 2009. I worked for a couple years at this place, BBN Technologies, doing speech recognition research. Then I went to grad school at UMass Amherst, um, working with Andrew McCallum, doing NLP and knowledge bases and graphical models, all sorts of fun ML stuff. Um, and then I came here, and I decided to pivot a little bit away from NLP. Um, because I got really excited about life sciences applications, in part because here in Kendall Square, there's just so much excitement around that in general. Um, and also because there's just a lot of low-hanging fruit um, in applications of ML to the life sciences that I thought would be fun to engage with. Um, OK. So uh, it's just I just want to double emphasize that this work has been done by a lot of people, um, and I'm just one of them. Um, so a lot of the credit is not due to me. Um, Okay, so another thing that's worth mentioning is that a lot of this work has been done in collaboration with the Google Accelerated Science team, which some of you may not have heard of. Um, it's worth mentioning because I think it's really cool. Um, and so GAS uh, seeks to just use Google technology to accelerate science. And um, really with a focus on improving humanity, not on you know product stuff. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things that Google has unique expertise in that can help um, achieve these goals. And so one of them is machine learning expertise. The other is just scale. So um, there's a lot of applications in biology that involve just a tremendous amount of um, data. Um, we're good at that. We have a lot of computers here, um, and, and that helps. So I have something running right now that's using like 40,000 computers. Um, that's nothing. Like my manager tells me to use more. Um, so just a very, very high level um, explanation of what proteins are um, for the sake of this talk. So proteins are make up, they're like the building blocks of, of life. They're um, encoded, um, they're coded for in your DNA, and then they're um, transcribed into RNA, which is transcribed into sequences of amino, amino acids. Um, and amino acids, you can think of, uh, I mean, uh, it's just a sequence of amino acids. It looks like an NLP uh, data. And what happens is that this is a molecule that folds into a three-dimensional structure, and the three-dimensional structure dictates its function. Um, and what I'm interested in is uh, applications where we can actually measure this function in the lab. Um, and there's, this talk is going to have two parts. So the first part of the talk is essentially considering this forward direction, so going from sequence to function. Um, a lot of you may have heard of these classic um, protein structure prediction um, tasks. So there's like this, this CASP prediction uh, thing every year. DeepMind got a lot of press recently for, for doing this. And that's different in that they're explicitly trying to predict 3D structure. Um, that's not something that we're trying to do in our team because we don't think it's a good way to solve the problem. So we're actually trying to go directly from sequence to protein function without modeling 3D, 3D structure in between, mostly because we have a lot more data um, if we skip the middle part. Um, and then in the second part of the talk, I'm actually going to flip the arrows around, and I'm going to um, talk about protein design work. So there, the idea is that you have some function that you want to optimize, and you're going to um, search in the space of sequences of amino acids in order to um, achieve that goal. OK. So um, in terms of uh, classifying proteins, I'm going to talk about some very, a very specific uh, topic. Um, and this is a paper that uh, I worked on recently. Um, and so we're looking at one very specific data set, but the modeling technique is quite general. Um, and so there's this uh, database called PFAM, which is a, um, an ontology of proteins. And it's actually an ontology of protein domains, which are like sort of s modular subsections of proteins. Um, and the idea here is that um, there's this underlying assumption that similarity in sequence space is associated with similarity in the space of like function of proteins. Um, and that's true in part because um, all of these proteins came from evolution, and evolution is this local search process. And so um, there is actually a lot of sort of sequence level analysis you can do to deduce um, sort of uh, uh, function. Um, and the thing that the community has done over the years is that they've done a combination of human and machine curation. So there's this data set called PFAM seeds, which are human verified and they're you know, sort of carefully curated. There's a small number of them. And then the idea is that people have fit models on these, statistical models on them, and use that to expand the set of um, proteins by searching large databases um, to find things that are likely to be um, similar to, to the seeds. 
Um, and so, you know, this sort of data is available online. Like, this, you know, has nothing to do with our work. It's been around for a while. People use it all the time. Um, and there's a lot of these ontologies of proteins, not just PFAM. Um, and so what we're doing, um, actually, I'm going to skip this slide. Um, so the, uh, the classic model for this, this, uh, this sort of data is to use what's called a profile hidden Markov model. So the idea there is that you have a big list of sequences that um, you think are um, related. And oftentimes, they're quite similar to each other because they came from evolution. They're, they're like from their siblings in the phylogenetic tree. And so what we do is we align them using some multiple sequence alignment algorithm. And then we stack up the um, aligned positions. And we get these little um, distributions per position. And we get a little transition distribution between adjacent positions. And so the hidden Markov model. And so what you can do is you can, um, given a new sequence, you can say, well, is this a likely um, member of uh, this family? And if so, add it to the family. So there's this iterative curation of these protein families by using these statistical models. It's like bootstrapping of ontologies of proteins. And so the question is, can we use neural networks to, to do this differently? And so you know, uh, HMMs have been replaced by deep neural networks in speech recognition, um, which is something that I experienced firsthand in my earlier life. And um, perhaps we could do that for, for proteins as well. And uh, this highlighted sentence here from um, an article last year is, is very, very important. So being able to um, curate these proteins is hugely important because nature has given us a lot of proteins with interesting properties, um, especially in, in bacterial genomes. Um, and the cost of sequencing has gone down so much that we just have so much data. The problem is that we can't annotate them. We don't have statistical models that are able to generalize sufficiently far from the data we've seen so far to actually um, create this sort of categorization. And this is like a sort of a fundamental Google style problem, right? Like our, our goal is to organize the world's information, and there's a lot of information in the world's proteins, right? There's hundreds of millions of them that we don't know any, like what they're doing. Um, and so uh, this, this guy, Max, on the team was like, you know what? This is basically just a computer vision problem, right? It's like you want to do some image classification or some image segmentation, image, image captioning. And like, the nice thing about deep learning is that it's, it's like extremely application agnostic, right? It's like you have some inputs, you have some outputs, you have some 100-dimensional vectors in between. Um, and what we're, uh, you know, there's this overall uh, theme in, in machine learning these days of basically like skipping um, hard-coded features and just learning everything end to end. And this sort of flies in the face of a lot of wisdom um, in the protein world where there's a lot of emphasis on this uh, secondary structure. So these like small sort of um, sub-pieces of um, three-dimensional structure that um, inform the, the co confirmation of the overall structure. And we're, we're basically completely avoiding that. Um, and so we use, uh, basically here, this is just to say that we have a classification task with a very large number of output classes, like 17,000, and it's extremely heavy-tailed, the distribution over um, sizes. Um, so it's just like a classic hard classification problem. Um, we're just going to throw out this like a very generic neural network. It's a ConvNet with um, residual connections and dilated convolutions. Um, and uh, that's sort of a standard machine learning workflow. We get a plot of results like this. This is going to, I'm going to unpack this. This takes a little bit of time. Um, and, and you know, some things will come up. So the basic idea here is that we're contrasting our models. So there's this prot CNN, prot ENN. Don't worry about the difference between them. They're both neural networks. Um, and then uh, there's this blast P and P Hummer, which are nearest neighbor classifiers. And so there's been a lot of work on very application specific similarity functions between proteins. Um, and so you can do nearest neighbor searches. And these are really slow because you're often matching onto a database of like, 100 million proteins or something, but they work well in practice. And you know, there's websites like blastp.org or whatever that people use. Um, another natural baseline is uh, this topic HMM thing, which is a profile hidden Markov model, which is like a modeling technique that the community is you know, deeply entrenched in. Um, and so when we first put out results um, on the bioarchive with this paper, there was a lot of pushback from people that have built their careers around using profile hidden Markov models. And so we've had to do extremely careful evaluation in order to demonstrate to them that these neural networks have a place at the table. And so what we're doing here is something like an evaluation procedure that um, I want to talk about in detail. Because suppose that you are never going to think about proteins again, um, but you are interested in machine learning. I think the way that we evaluated this model is like a general takeaway that you might want to use in your own personal work. Which is that rather than just taking, you know, we have five models and we have some accuracy score and we could have a table with five numbers and we could show that our model is best, we actually don't do that. We stratify our analysis 
by um, bucketing each test example, like by bucketing the test examples in terms of how far they are from the training set. So on the x-axis here, um, we have the similarity of a test example from the train set. So the idea is that more to the right means you're more similar to the train set. Um, and not surprisingly, the error rate goes down as you are more similar to the training set. But this is really important because the name of the game with machine learning is, is extrapolation, right? It's, it's how far away can you get from the training data, right? And understanding the shape of this curve can have huge impact on where you trust your model. Right? And models might have different trade-offs, where they're actually extremely good close to the training data, but don't do well far from the training data and stuff like that, or, or vice versa. Like they might have different shapes. Um, and so this is really important for proteins, because the sort of gold standard task is this thing called remote homology detection, which is, you know what, like classifying things that are close to what we already know is pretty boring. Um, but finding remote homologs, which are basically cousins that are really far in the phylogenetic tree, um, but are similar functionally is super important for like the sort of information retrieval workflow where a practitioner wants to engineer some new protein, they want to find something that's similar to something they've seen before, but like the sequences are actually quite different, but some model tells them that they're similar. Um, and so the left-hand side of this plot is what everybody cared about. Um, and this is how we really got buy-in from other professors and stuff like that, um, that you know, this stuff is, is worth taking seriously. So this, this sort of stratified analysis of your test set I think is super important. Clearly, you could do this with like natural language data, for example. Um, and so then this is just zooming in on the left-hand side of that plot. Um, this is like the sort of standard table that I'm saying you shouldn't do, and you should do the more sophisticated analysis. But it's worth noting that we're the best. Um, and then we had this experience where um, the, the people in the community that were skeptical of our results were like, no, you need to make the data set even harder. What you need to do is have this very structured relationship between train set and test set, so you can really probe it for this remote homologue uh, question. So what we did there is another thing that I think is a general technique that you should consider, which is we clustered our data, and we put certain clusters in the train set and certain clusters in the test set. So this is a technique that occurs a lot in these compile applications. And the reason is that um, because your data came from evolution, if you just naively uh, split it into train and test data, there will be test examples that are like one mutation away from a train example. And so you have to be really careful. Um, and so basically what this gave us is more statistical power at the left hand side of that, of that plot, because we just have more examples that are far um, in the test set. And we still do better, so that's cool. Um, OK. Another thing that we did is we took our model, we trained it, we chopped off the top, and we just used it as a mapping from protein sequences to uh, thousand dimensional vectors, just like an embedding function. And the idea is that the, this vector space, like in, uh, sort of Euclidean structure in this vector space should capture some semantics of neighborhood, neighborhood structure in protein sequence space. And so here I'm actually looking at uh, models that were trained on a different set of data, these uh, enzyme commission numbers, and we show that, um, which are hierarchical, and we show that our models Embedding space, when projected down to two dimensions, has some consistencies with the overall hierarchy um, that has been annotated, which is exciting. Um, and this sort of thing is a great way to get buy-in from um, scientists. Um, and then another thing you can do is actually, if you have this mapping from sequences to vectors, um, you can actually use it for what we call few-shot learning, which is that um, you can um, consider classes at test time that you never actually saw during train time, and you can do some sort of nearest neighbor classification. Um, which can be helpful, right? Because you might have this like sort of growing set of labels you want to predict. This is true in all sorts of applications. Okay, so another thing that we found was really important to get buy-in from biologists is to show that our model is making predictions for the right reasons. Um, and this is really hard um, in general, um, and we can do something that's like you know a step in the right direction, which is to show that our model um, has behavior that's consistent with some biological phenomena that the community has accepted to be true. So on the right, we have this thing called the Blossom 62 matrix, which is a matrix of pairwise uh, substitution affinities. It's basically like if I were to change certain letters to certain, uh, certain amino acids to certain other amino acids, it might not be that um, damaging of a mutation because they're sort of like uh, structurally, or like chemically similar. Um, and this just comes from observational data from evolution uh, on the right. On the left, we take the um, intermediate activations of our model and we look at um, cosine similarity of these things in embedding space. And what we find is that we actually recover extremely similar neighborhood structure. Um, so this is cool because there's this like, sort of biological invariant that we also uh, maintain. Um, so one question is, uh, why are these models useful? Um, an obvious answer is, well, we, want to we just want to classify things. Like I have a new protein sequence. I you know, have some bacterium I found in a 
pond and I sequence it and I want to know what the function of that bacteria is. Another thing we can do is we can actually ask, we can be, uh, use the model as a surrogate for experiments to perform interventions. We can say, like, if I were to have this mutation, um, what would happen? What would be the functional effect of this mutation? And this is like, you know, the, a really important question that will help drive things like drug development, right? Um, and so one th thing you can do is um, there's what's typically called um, saturation immunogenesis, which is you just change, you just consider every single possible single site mutation of a, of a protein sequence and you do this in vitro. You like actually run an experiment. Um, what we're doing is we're doing this in silico, which means that we just feed multiple sequences into our model with little mutations. Um, and what we're showing here, and this is not particularly compelling um, yet, is that the model's um, sensitivity to certain mutations is consistent with certain known patterns of secondary structure in the protein, namely these alpha helices. Um, but this sort of uh, using the model as a surrogate, like as a surrogate for the experiment in order to sort of prune away causal hypotheses is, is, um, is, is helpful. And um, certainly like, you know, this sort of thing gets done in, gets done in practice. Okay. Um, we've also done some work on interpretability. Um, I'm gonna skip it in the interest of time. We've also done some work on actually segmenting um, proteins into subsections that are like sort of like functionally modular subsections, which um, is really important. Um, and then what I want to do is spend more time talking about this, which is actually protein design, which is going from a functional measurement to a sequence. I want to design sequences that maximize some function. And I, I, I just realized I missed an author, Lucy Colwell, um, who's a professor at University of Cambridge, was instrumental in this work as well. Um, OK, so there's this really cool thing called an AAV capsid. So AAV, which I don't think I wrote, stands for, um, Oh my god, I'm so embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> uh, Adeno-associated virus. Um, I always forget this. Um, it's not a particularly interesting name. And the idea is that it's this big molecule that's actually um, 60 whittle proteins that stick together in this very specific conformation. Um, and it's like this big capsid thing that floats around, and it, and it can deliver cargo. Um, like it's, it's a virus. And so what's, what's neat about it, though, is that it actually, um, the immune system like, just doesn't really care about it. It's like invisible to the immune system. Um, and so it's used as a vector for delivering all sorts of gene therapy. Um, the problem is that um, we want to make it really specific. So we want to say, I want to deliver gene therapy to lung cells, for example. Um, and so the goal is to design new versions of AAV that are um, stable in the sense that they have the same conformation or you know, similar conformations. Um, but uh, have a specificity to only bind um, to certain uh, cells. Um, so uh, just very quickly, um, so at the bottom here, we have this like, you know, three-dimensional structure. It's actually 60 copies of this little protein stuck together. Um, the genome at the top of this uh, virus is like on the left in blue is just like some general life cycle machinery for, for it. And then on the right is this thing that we can actually edit. So this is a sequence of amino acids that we're going to start messing with. And the idea is that these are just the building blocks that are going to fold into this little protein, and we're going to start changing it, hopefully such that it becomes more specific in terms of what it binds to, but the immune system still um, ignores it. So um, there's a lot of details in terms of how to actually make edits to this protein, um, and this is why we are collaborating with wet lab people that um, know how to do these, these things. It's quite sophisticated. It's not like, you know, I just have a CSV file and then magically I get a number back, right? Um, and so uh, basically what you're doing is you're, um, you're printing these, like, these chips with these tiny little mutations and then there's this sort of like you're using some tra transcriptional machinery to pull in these changes onto existing proteins, stuff like that. It's cool. Um, and uh, what we're measuring here is we're not actually measuring specificity, which is you know binding to specific cells. All we're doing is we're trying to get a diverse set of AAV capsids that are all structurally stable. So the idea is that there's like two rounds of protein design. The first is to get a set of candidates that we think are cool um, using a cheap um, experimental procedure. And then once we have a small set of candidates, then we're gonna do an expensive thing that involves like actual specific cell lines and stuff like that. Um, and so the name in the game here is not just to find, you know, it's not, we're not actually maximizing a function. It's more like this um, find a diverse set of uh, sequences of amino acids that all satisfy some constraint. Um, and the way that you do this is that you just uh, do some basic like uh, sequencing of DNA um, or, or proteins, and so you, um, you're just measuring basically like the amount in um, over the amount out. 
Um, and by amount out, I mean like how many of these things actually, like you can screen things that are actually folded versus were just like junk that was flying around, floating around. Um, and, and that's the, the experimental procedure. Um, and so the way it works is that we first do some single site um, insertions and substitutions to these sequences in order to sort of just probe initially like what, what matters. Um, and then um, a very simple statistical model is that these things are additive. So it, like the sort of effect of multiple changes to a sequence is just the sum of its parts, which is a bad statistical model, but it's a good place to start. Um, and then what we do is we use this to reason about um, the quality of new sequences. And then we make them in the lab and we measure them. And here, what we're plotting is the relationship between how far the sequence is from like, the known AAV that occurs in the wild from how, whether it folds. And it drops off really, really fast. And this is problematic because the whole name of the game is finding a diverse set of things that, um, that fold. And so what we want this curve is to you know, go out much wider. Um, and so the question is, can we use machine learning to do this? Um, and so we have a variety of different ways to collect data. Um, the problem is that oftentimes this data is biased because it was collected by some smart grad student that had like, some ideas in their head about how to design proteins. But it's not sort of like a statistically uh, it's a nice thing you can sort of like reason about statistically. Um, train a bunch of neural network models, um, just like bread and butter machine learning. We um, then do some optimization of these models. And so the idea is that we fit the model to the data. We now pretend that this is a surrogate for the actual underlying function. Um, and then we just optimize these models with respect to their input. Um, this gives us a bunch of sequences. Um, and then what we get is we get these curves, which show that we can actually um, ignore the top row for now. Um, the bottom row shows that we can actually get way farther away from the starting sequence um, while maintaining the property that the protein folds if we use the machine learning model to guide us to high quality sequences. Um, and so this is really exciting, um, also because the sequences aren't just far from the starting sequence, um, they're actually diverse from each other. So this is the original curve, and this is what the curve looks like now. Um, there's a lot of details in terms of how you collect your data. This matters a lot. Um, in general, for your machine learning applications, this is something you should worry about a lot. There's all sorts of biases that can be um, in your data when it wasn't sampled um, you know, randomly, um, and you have to correct for those. Um, but this is really exciting, and the next step, of course, is to detect which of these have you know, specific binding to certain cells. Um, great. So I have four minutes left. I'd love to take questions um, about uh, you know, various uh, relationships between the life sciences and machine learning.